Well, we're on a series based on that, that I just encouraged everybody that visited on Easter, give me four weeks and I can promise you it will change your life. And that's a big promise, but we have a big God. And it's not me that's going to change your life. Uh, it, it's going to be the Spirit of God. And what I want to impart to you is that our God is true, our God is real, and he is alive today. Uh, he's not a distant God, he's a personal God. And when you let him into your life personally, it changes everything. And so we've started this little game that you guys have tend to enjoy. So I'm going to up the game a little bit. This, these are a little tougher, but what, here's what it is, is. Sometimes we have too narrow or too close up of a view of God. We understand Jesus came to save, that he died on the cross for our sins, that on uh, Resurrection Sunday, we call it Easter Sunday, he rose from the grave, the only person person to have been crucified, killed three days in hell, and then to come back with the keys to the gates of hell. He rose again. It's because he has power over death in the grave. He can give you life today. That's the God that we hear about. Jesus saves, right? And, uh, but that's a close-up view. God has more than that. And so to illustrate this, we've been taking some pictures that are close up that it's hard to really tell what it is until you get a bigger view, much like our view of Jesus. So these are a little tougher. Uh, the, the last one I may be gone a little easy on you, but let's take a look at the first one. The first one here, that's a close-up, an extreme close-up. Just kind of study it for a while. Like I said, you guys were getting good, so I had to up my game a little bit. You got your, vo you got your votes locked in. Here we go. Let's take a, a big picture. Ah, a couple of you nodded your head like you, you didn't know what that was. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so again, close up, it's obviously an image, but it's hard to see the whole picture. You guys want to do another one? Yeah. All right, let's do another one here. Again, uh, this one's, all right, that one's a little kind of weird, isn't it? A little creepy, but kind of look it over. Remember, this is an extreme close up, so try to get the big picture when you see it. All right, let's do that. Interesting, isn't it? The detail that God has. All right, I was pretty rough on you, so I went with kind of an easy, obvious one on the last one. I had to give you a win, but it's still amazing to see a close-up. Let's see what the close-up is. All right, take a look at it. Yeah, that one's pretty obvious. Yeah, there it is. The answer to this one, of course, is, yeah, D-Drive Road. Yeah, <laughs> pretty obvious. I know, I had to give you an easy win, but... Uh, I just want you to know I've been looking all week. I've been looking for it all week to that one right there. So we can go home now. So. But we'll get that fixed hopefully after Tuesday. Well, I tell you what, if you have your Bibles, there's going to be a couple places that I'm going to be sending you today. Uh, you, you want to turn to, um, uh, uh, well, where do I want you to turn to? There's like so many good scriptures here. I tell you what, here, here's... Uh, I'm going to have you turn to 2 Corinthians 10.5 and Romans 12.2. You can click on your Bibles or just I'll put them up on the screen for you as well. But what we've been looking at is in Luke 4.18, this is actually a verse that, that God put on my heart 18 years ago. This is one of my favorite verses in the sense that this verse was put on my heart to build this church upon 18 years ago. Um, it was Luke 4.18. And there was a frustration that I was having where I just thought, you know, I'm not seeing a, a lot of difference between the saved and the unsaved. I see people that have given their lives to Christ still struggling. And while I was praying and down by the river, this is uh, the verse that he gave me that he says, I'm calling you to Battle Creek to start the church, Victory Life Church, and I want you to build it upon this scripture. And it's this, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me, which means the Father has sent him with a special purpose and power. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor in spirit. Without Jesus, we're bankrupt. Our spirit is bankrupt. So some would say he came to save. That's what this verse is saying, to preach the gospel to the poor in spirit. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. There's only one that can heal the broken heart, and that's Jesus. That's what he does. When you get a bigger picture of who he is, we have a close up that Jesus saves, but Jesus is also the one that today wants to heal your broken heart. When he saves us, he saves our spirit, but when he heals the brokenness, he's healing our soul. That's our mind, our will, and emotions. He heals the broken heart to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. 
Jesus, in other words, comes to save, to heal, and to set the captives free, and to give spiritual sight to those that are spiritually blind to who they really are. And that's what we want to take a look at, and that is this, that today he came to set you free, that he wants each of us to live a life that's free, that we, he wants us to live not to just get by, but he says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. And so in 2 Corinthians 5.17, I want to explain how he heals and restores because when he comes to save, he instantly transforms our spirit. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. So your spirit was instantly transformed. The moment that you say, Jesus, come into my life, he gives you eternal life in your spirit. However your soul still exists. And not only does your soul exist, but who programmed that soul? What programmed that soul was that old spirit. That old good-for-nothing spirit is what programmed your soul. And in your soul is your hurts, your wounds, your emotions. And so he instantly transforms your spirit, but now he begins a journey that takes a lifetime to renew the soul. All the hurts, the wounds, the bondages, the things that hold us captive, he begins to renew those things. Philippians 2, 2 says it this way. There's a work that begins, and it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to, look at this, work out your salvation. It doesn't say work for your salvation. You need to work it out, meaning this, that there is still, our spirit is brand new, but we wake up the next morning and there's still a mess and a joke in our, in our soul of hurts and wounds. In other words, I like to say this, you can be saved and on your way to heaven and all messed up. That it's not a hypocrite because you have problems and you have issues. We all have challenges and issues in our lives. That it's not, it, just because you're still stumbling in, in things in your life, be it with anger or addiction, doesn't make you a hypocrite. What makes you a hypocrite is when you quit pursuing the relationship with God. And that's why Jesus looked at the scribes and the Pharisees. They were just getting some head knowledge, but they weren't seeking the relationship. And that's why he called them hypocrites. You see, we're on this journey. And as long as we're leaning into the relationship, it brings healing. He heals, he restores, and he brings freedom. And so he says, you've got to work out. You've got to work out your salvation, meaning you've got to bring healing to the soul um, in there. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, to, uh, in you to will and to act according to his God's purpose. This is so strong. Our mind is so strong. And in our mind resides the lies of the enemy. It is so strong at convincing us that something is true when it's not true. But it seems so true, but it's not true. Truth is found in the Word of God. This is how powerful the mind is. And this is why we need to renew our mind, because our mind has been programmed by the old spirit. It's full of lies. It's full of deceptions. And God wants to set you free. But here's the power of the mind. I had a friend that uh, was in an accident, and he had his knee amputated, uh, or his leg amputated from the knee down. And he developed this thing that they called phantom limb syndrome crazy thing, leg was gone at the knee. This shows you how powerful the mind is, how deceptive the mind can be. He would complain because his foot itched. Now what do you do with that? When, when the leg is gone from the knee down and he, in his mind, can feel his foot itching and there's nothing there to itch. That's how powerful the mind at telling you a lie and trying to convince you something that it's true when it doesn't even exist. And how much more is that true when it comes to our identity? That you'll always be single. That you'll, you'll always, you'll always uh, feel discouraged, depressed. You'll always be struggling with addictions. You'll always be this. You'll always be that. And, and we've learned these things before the spirit became new. And, and we need to retrain now the way the mind thinks and what it listens to. 
We need to redirect the mind to what is now truth because truth was always based on experience and feelings and emotions. You ask the mind if the foot itches and the mind will go, that foot itches. Doctors will say, there's no foot. And rather than looking to our experience now as our truth, we begin to look to the word of God. And so here's the first thing I want to give you to live in a life of freedom, and that is this. Jesus wants to set you free. He's come to set you free. We saw the beginning of the journey in baptism. We, we believe that baptism plays a significant part in our journey to freedom. As we take a look at 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 10, 2. This is what it says. It says, They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And what this is referring to is freedom, like salvation, is mentioned throughout the Bible. Going back to Exodus chapter 14, which was written 1,400 years before Jesus, we see God the Father setting his people free, don't we? that we see them into bondage as slaves to the Egyptians, and he first saved them by the blood of the lamb. He had them sacrifice a lamb, put it on the door frames of the post. The, the Spirit of God came through. All those that had the, lamb, the lamb's blood on the doorpost found life. Those that didn't found death. This is a foretelling of Jesus, the lamb of God. It is the blood of Jesus or the blood of the lamb that gave them life. Yes, the blood saves you. We know that. But they woke up the next morning, they were still slaves. They were still held in bondage. It wasn't until God brought them out of Egypt, their past was chasing after them, trying to take them back into bondage. Can anybody relate to that? For every step forward you take, sometimes it feels like you've taken two steps back. They came to the Red Sea. The Red Sea parted. They walked through, and then their past tried to chase after them and take them back into bondage. But the Red Sea closed over the, the enemy that was pursuing them. And that's what that verse is talking about. On that day, they were baptized unto Moses. In Hebrews eleven twenty nine, 29, it tells us this. By faith. Faith is just another word for trust. By trust or by faith, people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. When we put our trust in God, he wants to bring freedom into our lives. These people that were baptized today, they started their journey to freedom. The Bible says this, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. The biggest problem we make is we try to solve supernatural issues through natural means, don't we? But when we get water baptized, it severs the ties and the strongholds of our past on our lives. We bury that old past and we begin a journey that's new and it begins in freedom. We find freedom begins in the water, that, that salvation begins with the blood, but it's through the water uh, that, that he brought freedom into our lives. Look at what John 19, 34 says. 1,400 years later, Jesus dies on the cross. His blood is shed by the, lamb of the, uh, the blood of the lamb. We find life and salvation. But it said instead, one of the soldiers, while he was hanging on the cross, they were going to break his leg so he would die quicker. And it said, one of the soldiers pierced the side with a spear, bringing out a sudden flow of what? Blood and water. Look at that on the cross. The blood is life, the water is freedom. On the cross, what that's saying is on the cross... Jesus gave you life, and Jesus gave you freedom. If you believe in the blood, you got to believe in the water that was spilled at the cross too. Jesus came to set you free from any stronghold, addictions, and oppressions. That's who he is. He's come to set the captives free. You know, what illustrates this that I see a lot of believers that they're saved, they're on their way to heaven, but they just never experienced freedom before. They don't even believe it's possible. They just believe this is the way life is. They've tried in their own strength, they've tried using willpower to change, and, and it only makes it worse. Have you ever tried to go on a diet and lose 10 pounds and gain five? That, that's what willpower does, right? That, that's as far as your strength can get you in life. There was a story I read, an autobiography of Harry Houdini. 
And Harry Houdini, many of you realize, he, he was an escape artist during the vaudeville times, known as the world's greatest escape artist. And uh, he was a showman, and uh, he would do all these escapes and challenges. He would challenge people that he could escape out of anything. And there was a, a new prison that was designed and built in England. And it was supposed to be state-of-the-art of its time, it supposed to be escape-proof. So what they decided to do is they would put the world's greatest escape artist in the prison before it opened up just to prove that it was unescape, that it couldn't be, you couldn't escape from it. And so he accepted the challenge as an opportunity, as a publicity stunt. Uh, he goes over there and he agrees to do this elaborate show that evening, but he's gonna get locked in the jail, uh, this new jail that nobody can escape from. He's gonna get locked in it in the afternoon and then escape just in time to perform that night. The theater sells out. People could care less what he's gonna do in the show. People are just looking to see if he even shows up for the show. And so they wanna make sure that they're not made a, a spectacle on this new prison. So they really take a lot of uh, attention to detail to make sure he doesn't smuggle anything in. They do not want him to succeed at this. They take his clothes, they put him in another jail cell. They didn't tell him they were gonna do that. They search him to make sure he's not taking in any pics or anything to try to get out. They leave after a thorough search, they leave. He had the ability to, to swallow a pick, so he coughed up the pick. He goes over to the cell, he reaches through, and he begins to try to pick the lock. Now this is in his, in his uh, diary that nobody knew about until after he died. He begins to work on this lock, and he's listening for the tumblers in the lock. And he can't get them to click into place. And he's working, he's working, he's working. One hour goes by, two hours go by, three hours go by. He's now getting nervous because he can't get the picks to work and to get the tumblers in the lock to fall and he's listening and he's working it, he's working it. He's now sweating and he's beginning to think of the failure that lies ahead of him. He's beginning to think of what the headlines is gonna say the next day, the world's greatest escape artist has failed. And, and he worked at it, and he worked at it, and then finally he realized after several hours that he was not going to be able to pick the locks and that he had been defeated. And it said in his journal that he was exhausted, and he gave up, and his head fell against the bars, and the door opened. <laughs> well, Houdini didn't realize is the guards were so thorough in searching him that they forgot to lock the door when they shut it. <laughs> and that the reason he couldn't get the tumblers to click is because they were already falling into place and he had worked and that the door was open the entire time. And so here's what begs the question. What makes one a prisoner and held captive? One that sits in a locked cell? or one that simply thinks the door is locked. Jesus says this in, in Revelation 1.8, I was dead, but now I'm alive, and I hold the keys to hell. Here's the thing. He died on the cross, and the door is open. It's up to you to step out through the door. The way we find freedom, the way we walk out of this prison cell that we're convinced the door is locked when Jesus has the keys and he opened it for us is through the word of God. And in the word of God, God's word is what will set us free. And so God's word has the power to set us free. In, in John 18, 31, Jesus says this to the Jews who had believed in him, if you hold to my teachings... You are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If I hold on to this, this is what is going to bring me freedom in my life. When I hold on to this, what it means by holding on to this is I, as I read it, this becomes my source of truth, that what this says is more true in my life than what my life has already experienced. That's what hold on to his word is all about. It is the word and, and the word is truth and you will know the truth and the truth will what? Truth will set you free. Freedom is found in the word of God. 
Listen, if you go to the doctor because you have migraines and he prescribes, uh, he prescribes medicine, taking the, taking, getting the prescription filled and setting it on the counter does you no good. It, you have to ingest it and get it into your system and into your body for it to have an effect on your brain. The Word of God does no good if it sits, but we have to take it, ingest it, and get it into our brain to find the healing that we're looking for. And so I hold on to his truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 2 Corinthians 10 says this, We demolish arguments and every uh, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. When I have found freedom in my life from depression, that spirit of depression, anxiety, I had to become self-aware of how I was talking. I would always call myself a loser. Man, I'm just a loser. And then all of a sudden, I had to take that thought captive and go, now where is that in the Bible? Well, I know it's not in the Bible, it's just the way I feel. My foot itches and I've got no leg is the situation. I need to rewire the brain because it's been taught in an old system, in an old spirit. And so I had to take that thought captive going, is that what God thinks of me? Does God think I'm a loser? I, I, I found freedom from trying to always achieve to prove my self-worth. And I had to take that thought captive and constantly compare it to the Word of God. Here's an expression we always like when we're talking with people and ministering to people, and they're just saying, well, I'll never find anybody that's good. Well, I'll, I'll just never get healed. Well, I'll just never, I'm always this way. I'm, I'm just a yeller. That's just the way I am. And we like to say this to them. What if that's not true? Let's take that thought captive and let's put it to what the word of God says, which is now going to be our absolute truth because he unlocked the prison cell. He's waiting for you to walk out. And the way you walk out is by believing this and not what's in your head. In fact, here's a stronghold diagram I show it on how we get put into bondage is usually what happens is there's a negative event that happens in our lives. Maybe you've gone through a divorce. Maybe you've been hurt, maybe you've been betrayed, and, and, you'll just, and you'll say, I'll never let anybody hurt, hurt me like that again. And, and so uh, you, people can't be trusted, and there's the lie that is now hooked. There's usually a negative event that happens in our lives, and there's a lie that we associate with that. That enemy speaks into our head and gives us a lie, and then once we have that lie, we then put in a defense mechanism. Well, you know what? People can't be trusted. I've trusted people and they've betrayed me. That's the lie. So now I'm going to put this defense mechanism in. I'm going to keep everybody at arm's way so they can't do that to me again. And now what happens when you try to build a relationship and you keep them at arm's way? People react to that, don't they? Pretty soon they walk away and it reinforces the negative event. You hear this? Why, why is it that I always find losers? And we see this cycle of one broken relationship after another because there was an event that we associated a lie to it that people can't be trusted, that you, you can't be honest with people, that you've got to guard your heart because people will take advantage of it. And then we put in the, these defenses in our lives so it doesn't happen. And then people react and it reinforces. And you just see this treadmill just going through our lives like this. I remember that I, I was just on this this treadmill that was all about performance. And, and so I just remember asking the Holy Spirit, where did this come from? I, I was always trying to prove myself. You know those people that always read their resumes to you when you shake their hand? I was always trying to impress. I was always trying to achieve. I was always trying to accomplish. I, I was finding my identity and my self-worth and what I was doing rather than who I was. And so I just asked, you know, where did this lie come from? Where is this even coming from, God? Why am I like this? And I, and I, and I just remembered vividly the, this, this moment, this lie, and it was innocent. It doesn't need to even be traumatic, but I just asked the Holy Spirit to go, where did this come from? Because this is killing me. I'm performance driven. And because I'm performance driven, I'm thinking God is performance driven. I have to please God. 
I, I have to build a church to please God. I have to, I have to do this to, just to, to, to please people. I'm performance driven. It was never enough. And so I just go, where, where did this come from? And I just remember a, a very clear moment in time that my mom was talking to somebody and she just innocently said, uh, that this, is, this is my baby of the family and this is my oops baby. My mom loves me. My mom meant nothing by that. But I remember that. I was about six years old, and I was the oops baby. I wasn't planned. I wasn't expected. And so there was an event, and there was a lie I now associated to it. So now I'm going to put in a defense mechanism to compensate that maybe I'm not an oops baby. I'm going to strive my whole life to prove I'm not a mistake. Isn't that crazy how just a little lie like that can just jack you up the rest of your life. And so I just start performing to prove that I'm not a mistake. And, it, and, it's, and it's killing me, it's killing me. I'm on this treadmill. And so I have this moment and here's where you take a thought and it goes from a thought into a belief. A thought is in your head, a belief is in your heart. In Jeremiah 1, 5, it says, I knew you when I formed you in your mother's womb. I just happen to be reading the word. Why? Because I'm holding on to God's word. I'm not looking to go, why am I messed up? God, give me the answer, and then pointing here. I'm just daily having my time with him, daily reading the word, and then all of a sudden he takes me to a verse that I read a long time ago. And I'm sitting quietly trying to figure this thing out in my life. Why, why is there anxiety in my life? Father, I want to be free from that. And, I, and I'm going back to being an oops baby. And everybody's telling me, God's got a purpose. God's got a plan for you. Yeah, I know, I know. But here's my reality. And all of a sudden in this quiet time, he speaks to me. And he calls to my memory, Jeremiah 1.5. And he says, I formed you in your mother's womb. And I remember my head, my brain going, yeah, I know that. And I just, he goes, James, I made you. And you weren't a mistake. It was just real clear. I and mean, just, I just all of a sudden, I knew it, but now I believed it. God made me. God, I, there, this is what I like to tell people. There's no oops babies in God's kingdom. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And I remember I just began to cry in that moment where that truth goes from here to here and I was set free from that anxiety in my life of never feeling like I'm quite good enough, that I, quite, I don't quite measure up. Why? I was set free from all that stress and anxiety in that moment through God's word. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not conform any longer to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Here, here's what I like to say. Information changes your mind. Revelation changes your heart. You'll know the truth. Truth will set you free. Your truth from your Father is waiting right here for you. Amen? Let me pray for you. Before he can set you free, you have to allow him to heal your heart. In fact, when he heals your heart is when he, you'll find freedom in your life. But before he can heal the brokenness, you've got to trust him with your life. You know, the only way we have to deal with our pain outside of, of Christ is, is to just our own will and strength to try to push through and persevere and it will never get you to the other side. Trust him with your life because then he'll show you he's the, God, he's the God that heals brokenness and he's the God that sets the captives free. And there's one question every heart needs to have answered. The question is this, is my heart right with God? And with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I, I just want you to have that honest conversation. Father, is my heart right with you? And if you're sitting there going, oh, I hope so, or I think so, maybe you might even be saying, I've always believed in God, but it's not enough to just try hard to be a good person or even believe in God. But the Bible says in Romans, those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And what that verse means is there's got to be a defining moment in our lives where we weren't just trying hard to be good, but there's got to be a moment where we surrendered and realized we needed to be rescued. And we said, Jesus, come into my life. And if you don't have a moment like that, this is your moment right now. You trust him with this moment. And I promise you, he will show you the path to freedom of whatever you're struggling with, whatever anxiety, whatever addiction. He is a God that has conquered the grave and will bring freedom to those who trust him. But what I'm going to do is on the count of three, I'm going to pray for those that are sitting there going, well, I don't know if I've had a specific time where I've asked Jesus into my life. I don't know if my heart's right, but today I want to know. I want you to include me in that prayer. If that describes you on the count of three to be included in that prayer, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Don't miss this opportunity. It will change your life. Here it is. One, two, three. Just lift your hand. Include me in that prayer. Thank you. I see that hand right there. I see another one in the back there. Keep your hand up because I want to give you some information. And if you're in the connect room, I want you to raise your hand. There's two. Is there another one? Just lift your hand. Include me in that prayer. One, two. Is there another one? Three over here. Is there another one? Include me in that prayer. Romans 10, 9 says this. If you confess, uh, four, a uh, fourth one just went up. Awesome. Awesome. So proud of you guys. Don't miss this chance. He's just waiting for you to give him permission. Just lift your hand and be included in this prayer. He'll prove to you that he is the God that saves, heals, and sets free. Anybody else? Just raise your hand right now. Another one right here in the center. Awesome. There, keep, if you could keep your hand up for me right in the center. There's another one that's right over there. That's five. Awesome. Because we want to give you this information. Romans 10, 9 says this, that if you confess right here in the center. Yeah, would you raise your hand so they can pass you that? Awesome, sweetie. Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. What a beautiful promise that is. Because he's not waiting for you to fix yourself. We can't do that. We're messed up with him and we're messed up without him. But he's asking us to surrender and that's what we're going to do. So if you raised your hand or you meant to, I want you to pray this prayer out loud. And if you're watching online, pray this prayer out loud with us. And church, if you'd pray for encouragement, just pray, Oh, Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe you died on the cross, that you rose again, and you're seated on the throne. Jesus, forgive me for all that I've done wrong. And I choose to forgive all others. Come into my life. Today and forever, I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen.